but it's like I'm not really one for like looking in the mirror much. I think in a way it's almost like I had to <clears throat> imagine it was there was so much imaginative work that was that I had to do that was, and it, about like her from the inside that whenever I was in the hair and makeup chair I was kind of like head down um and it, the moments that I was like oh god but sometimes when Sam would call cut and it was like it, I knew that that was right you know and I'd be like please <laughs> you know that I, that's <laughs> that it <one. laughs> um you know so it was more yeah just like a feeling of her or like what, certain words that I would say or things that I, I I would feel in a scene that I was like I know that that was right you know I don't write songs to be famous. I write songs because I don't know what I'd do if I didn't. I have to say, in my dreams, when we were thinking about who could play Amy, I, I wouldn't have been able to conjure up anyone as, as magnificent as Marisa. She really is extraordinary. In fact, Leslie Manville, who plays her, her, her gran, was doing her, was doing her EPK the other day and was asked about her. and. Uh, Leslie, you know, Leslie was asked as you know somebody, uh, what was it like working for Marissa in her first big film role, and Leslie took a breath and then she said, you know, once in a lifetime, mm. once in a lifetime, somebody comes along with this kind of talent, and you can just stand back and marvel as she steps into her power, and I think that's what we all felt. We were watching something very special. We shot around the streets where Amy lived. We actually did some stuff in her first flat. That was very emotional for me to be in her flat because you suddenly, you realise it was very small. She was a young girl. She was just starting her life. She was, she was, um, she had an incredible talent and, 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 and yet addiction took hold. And, and it, it breaks your heart when you see what, what the potential she had and that addiction robbed her of her life. Yeah. I actually moved to Camden for the filming and for the preparation and I, did and it was amazing because obviously for the, the, those four months of preparation, no one knew that I was making this movie. So I could go to the Good Mixer in the Dublin Castle on the Horny Arms and like just sit there and overhear and listen to people and like you know. Also, it it, it it it's a different it's different if you're going on like a Saturday night to the Dublin Castle or if you're going on like a Wednesday afternoon to the good mm. mixer and you're like watching people play pool and thinking to yourself like wow like Amy was just like here with these people playing pool and like that it just like really soaking in what it would have meant to be just in that space at that time was was definitely important you gotta remember I ain't no spy girl Amy Winehouse <laughs> We're getting a great reaction from people, and, and it's you know it's a, it's a very it's a very emotional film. I mean, Sam, the di Sam, our director, uh, was always calling me the cryometer when we were making it because I kept crying all the <laughs> during the whole shoot and through every cut of the film. I never I never became sort of immune to it, and I was just still pouring with tears. It's a uh, yeah, it's a uh, it's a weepy for sure. To be fair, we've hardly done any screenings. We've really sort of tried to hold it back. So really the biggest and only screening I've been at is um, we did one for the cast and crew, everyone who worked on the film, and a few friends. And yes, that was quite heavily the reaction from a lot of people, a lot of tears, a lot of people wanting to go home and listen to the music, which is amazing. And yeah, and a lot of emotions and feelings around some of the things we tackle in the film. I think I was proud of the pacing of it also, you know, with the humour sort of locked in with, with, with the tragedy and, and, and I think, yeah, coming out of it a bit discombobulated is, uh, is it, I think in this instance, is probably a good thing. It means it's hit hard. I want to be remembered for just being me. About a year before they, 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 they offered it to me, I knew that they were going to come to me to play Mitch. And I had a friend of mine who worked with Amy and Mitch, and he had first-hand experience of their relationship. And I knew that there was a narrative about Mitch, but I didn't want to be uh, influenced by any narrative. So I asked my friend who had first-hand experience, and he said that he liked Mitch. He said that Mitch was the father. 
He was in an impossible situation. He loved his daughter, he tried his best, and he made mistakes. And I've got four teenage kids, and I thought that was a really healthy, honest perspective. And I, I, I said to myself, I won't do this film if it sanitizes Mitch or if it demonizes him. And then when I got the script for Matt and Sam told me her vision, I realized we were all on the same page. Because this film is shot from Amy's perspective. So you realize why she fell in love with Blake. You realized how much she loved her dad. But the villain of the piece is addiction. If there's a secondary villain of the piece, it's the paparazzi. Because there's a reason why recovery programs are called Alcoholics Anonymous and, and Narcotics Anonymous, because in order to recover from addiction, you need privacy and anonymity. And Amy was never afforded that. She was hounded and mocked and humiliated in the middle of her addiction. The picture of it, when you flip that round, that means she always had, you know, six, eight, ten big guys with cameras just wherever she went. And what that must have felt like and how intimidating that is, you know, whatever you're feeling on that day, to always have somebody or a multitude of guys, you know, just documenting, you know, just what that, you know, what that felt for her must have weighed very heavy. So it felt like an important aspect of the film because in my research it was so apparent that she was almost never on her own. That's actually the main reason that we wanted to make the film, was we felt that she had been uh, plagued in a way but in her life with everyone's opinions about her, everyone had something to say, the tabloids were, you know, marking her. There was even a column called Why No Watch that, you know, was, was, was posting terrible pictures of her every week. And even in death, Everyone has an opinion about her. So I think we wanted to use this film to, to give Amy, to, for, to make it from Amy's point of view. As Sam always said, from, she wanted to make a film that was from the inside out rather than the outside in. So that we took as our, as our guiding star Amy's lyrics, Amy's notebooks, and Matt kind of, you know, just took that and, 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 and crafted the story from Amy's point of view and Amy's perspective. Yeah, I think it was important that it was mine and Sam's point of view as well. So, you know, getting into that and kind of blocking off the, all the, all the not noise, but the world of Amy sort of commentary about it, because it would have been impossible to incorporate. I want people to hear my voice. Blah. And just forget their troubles. Boy! I spent all day. I, I, when when it happened, I was just wishing that it hadn't. I was just staring at the TV, just saying, "This can't be right. This this isn't." And you know, it devastated me. Uh, I I didn't feel. I, I, but in many ways, as Alison will say, it's it's the right time to to sort of revisit because I, I do think a lot of water's passed under the bridge for for Amy, and it, and we wanted just to we change the narrative slightly. Uh, and make it more celebratory, uh, and and just cast a light onto her rather than to the to the darkness. When someone like Amy dies, someone so young who affected our lives in such a profound way because of her talent, there's kind of a collective trauma, and the the response to trauma is to make sense of it. And the way you make sense of it is you get a you you adopt a comfortable narrative, a reassuring narrative. And the reassuring narrative of this is that someone was to blame. It was Blake or it was Mitch. Because what, the way that's reassuring is you think to yourself, well, if my daughter doesn't marry someone like Blake, or if I don't behave like Mitch, this won't happen to me. Well, addiction doesn't work like that. We all know people who one sibling is really productive in their life. They go on, they have a very productive life, and, one, or, and their brother or sister is an addict, and they both grew up with loving parents. Addiction is is arbitrary, it's chaotic, it's cruel, it's ruthless, and it kills people. And what I love about this film is that addiction is the main villain. I love that. But one of the things about this film is, is it challenges that narrative, that reassuring narrative, that this won't happen to you if you don't behave like Mitch or Blake. And it challenges that, and that's why people don't want to hear it. But I'm really proud that it does.